Uh, today we have Dr. Kent Scribner from uh, Michigan State. Um, he does quite a bit of uh, genetics work um, around the Great Lakes and uh, beyond. He actually did his uh, undergrad here at Stevens Point, and then uh, he did his PhD with John Avis at the University of Georgia, who's really one of the, the pillars of uh, modern population genetics. And so today he's going to tell us about um, some of this really amazing work um, on a, a sturgeon population in Michigan. Some of the the, the neatest examples of uh, pedigree analyses and wild populations that I've seen. Uh, so I'm really excited. Um, afterwards, we've got another a reception, and then uh, we've got another speaker next week, uh, same time, um, going towards the wildlife theme. So hopefully you guys can join us for that. Thanks so much, Kim, for coming, and uh, with that, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's really great to be here. I'm standing here in a classroom that I probably had most of my undergraduate classes in. Uh, animal physiology, soils, forestry, wildlife. So it's great to be back. Things have changed a bit. I haven't had opportunity to be here for many, many years, but uh, I was here from 1975 to 79 and really, really enjoyed it. And actually, genetics was my favorite class as an undergraduate. And if some of you were here long enough and you knew Doug Post, I don't know if you did, but um, uh, Doug really wound my crank uh, in many different ways, and uh, uh, it's largely to him that, uh, that I really took off into a combined wildlife fisheries and genetic mode. <coughs> so what I'd like to do today is um, talk about some work that we've been doing with uh, lake sturgeon for about 18 years now, for a very long time. Um, there's a couple of underlying themes here. First theme is just the importance of interdisciplinary study. So I'm not just a geneticist and I'm an evolutionary ecologist. We collaborate with a lot of different people. And one of the things that we're interested in is learning more about the organism to provide a science-based management prescription that includes information about things like recruitment and mortality. So that's really important. The second thing is, is that our system, um, like many systems, is very anthropogenically affected. And a lot of these effects and one of the themes here are what the cues that the disruption of natural flow of temperature and other regimes mean to these organisms. Um, and I'll present some data through different stages of ontogeny that describe the biotic and abiotic factors that are really affecting, really driving recruitment and mortality. And I hope one of the take home messages is the importance and the value of genetics data to be able to collect some of this information. So um, I'm just a very humble mouthpiece to uh, a lot of people for a lot of years. If you're working on long lived organisms, you must have uh, long term data, which means uh, a lot of people, technicians, graduate students to thank, and uh, we've been very, very fortunate to have many, many gifted people. Um, I'm going to start out with a quote from um, Don Tinkle. Don was an evolutionary ecologist, worked a lot on lizards, but he also worked on long-lived turtles. And Don, uh, this is a quote from one of his papers, said, short-term studies dealing with organisms with short generation times rather than long-lived ones, have been selected to withstand year-to-year -year variation in the environment and are therefore central of interest in the studies of life histories and interspecific ecological interactions. And then one of Don's postdocs and a good friend of mine coined this phrase that studies of long-lived interparous organisms necessitate studies of intolerable length. And I don't know if 18 years have been intolerable, but I have yet to see the first generation of fish come back. And so um, this is not a Drosophila that you can learn things about. Uh, it's a species with considerable complexities. And that's really important because a lot of the management, the conservation of species are really focused on trying to understand recruitment. How many individuals can we predict in some future time period conditional on recruitment from within and immigration from other sources. But in an evolutionary context for long-lived species, you really need to think about things in terms of current reproduction versus residual or long-term reproductive value. And so what this shows is the reproductive value under, um, uh, in, in, in the currency of reproductive success, but it's focused on current as well as residual reproductive value. So at some time, point zero, you have no current fecundity. You, everything is ahead of you in the future. But as you age over time, the decisions and the evolutionary stable strategy in terms of devoting resources currently to current reproduction 
to future reproduction success really very much changes. And so the older you get, the more likely you are, and it's your, to your advantage to expend more in terms of current reproduction because the number of reproductive bouts that you can anticipate in the future decreases. And so this different strategy in, in organisms which are spawning with many, many different cohorts of many, many different ages is really important because individuals reproducing at any single time, they're of different ages and by definition, they're really thinking about things in terms of maximization of current versus future reproductive success very differently. And importantly, the environmental conditions at any given time are really important as, as drivers um, of, of uh, current reproductive strategies. Adding to this, we're, we're living in an unprecedented time um, where environmental changes, whether it be temperature or flow regimes or other things, are in, leaving indelible footprints. And they're really changing cues and the adaptive landscape. So cues in the context of what organisms are responding to to deal with you know, daily um, activities and, and critical functions like reproduction, um, but also in terms of their abilities to adapt to these in different environments. And what this shows are just a, a, a series of things associated with climate change as one of the, uh, one of the important drivers. And the whole idea of uh, cues is shown in what I think is really a nice study, um, which was published a number of years ago, which talks about this concept of, of um, evolutionary and ecological traps. And so given a situation where you have organisms which are exposed to an original cue. This could be temperature or warming temperature, declining discharge. These cues under normal conditions elicit an original response and you have an expected outcome, right? So temperatures goes up, fish come in, they spawn, they spawn successfully, the world is good. But increasingly, these cues in a different environment, not the original one, you have potentially the same cue. Maybe temperatures are warming but it's the 28th of February, it's not the 28th of April, which elicits an original response, but you have an unexpected outcome. You have fish coming in to spawn, and the water temperature decreases eight days in a blizzard when you have two feet of snow, right? I mean, that is an example. So there are many examples of what cues determine, um, and the results of these are really catastrophic in some cases, and because paiculothermic vertebrates are really indelibly tied to their environment, this has become increasingly important. And an organism's response can be varied, but they're becoming increasingly limited, particularly for long-lived species. So organisms can disperse, so it's not very good here, so I'll just go someplace else. We know that landlocked populations of things like fish, it's very difficult to do that and somebody, unless somebody takes them and moves them there. You can adapt, and this is more of a genetic or microevolutionary, so there's differential reproductive success, differential survivorship, there'll be some genotypes that do okay and there are some genotypes that don't do so okay. And then there's plasticity, and increasingly plasticity or the adjustments behaviorally, physiologically, um, uh, can be really uh, critical to organisms as they're moving forward. And really understanding how various microevolutionary forces like gene flow and selection um, <clears throat> and plasticity come into play to help us understand the currency of current and future reproduction success is really important. But one of the real critical things to think about, and this is particularly true for sturgeon, is can long-lived species adapt? And I think this is really very important. Long-lived species have delayed sexual maturity. They have long generation times, which means they find it very difficult to track these environmental changes. If you have a rate of environmental change which is greater than the abilities of an organism to reproduce and for evolution in, in terms of adaptation to selection to be able to deal with that, it becomes very, very difficult for those organisms to adapt genetically or basically on microevolutionary. And so this concept of plasticity in terms of behaviors, spawning time, um, and other things become uh, really very critical. So that's just a little bit of a background, what I'd like to cover with some examples from our research. Lake sturgeon are uh, a species of conservation concern. They're threatened in many places, including the state of Michigan. And as you can see here, just by the different symbols,
I'll highlight the yellow stars which predominate on this landscape and these are the extirpated populations. Most of them are either extirpated or um, are of small population size. The population sizes and the distribution have declined by 90 or 99% over the course of the last 150 years. The factors that are involved are varied. Um, so what we did during the logging days to rivers and the abilities of rivers to sustain populations was really not so good. We had bad water, we had over harvest, and we had human beings building structures in areas where animals were um, spawning. So many of these things have been changed with the Clean Water Act and other regulations and cessation of harvest, but we're dealing with uh, barriers still today. Um, and again, we're dealing with climate change. So a little bit of biology about lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon are uh, broadcast spawning species. They're highly polygonous, which means males and females have multiple mates. They're iteroparous. Interspawning intervals vary for males and females, but they spawn multiple different times, and they have, at least in our system, a high degree of fidelity to different sites. <coughs> They're very long-lived, unless somebody puts a spear through them. They can certainly live over 100 years. They have delayed sexual maturities. Males become sexually mature perhaps 12 to 15 years. Females over 18. It's longer in our landlocked population than it is in the Great Lakes. And there's very, very low natural recruitment. So it's really astounding that a sturgeon, which is so highly fecund, these females have 11,000 eggs per kilogram. And some of the fish in our population are 60 kilograms. So how can a fish that is that wildly fecund not reproduce to the point where it replaces itself over 20 reproductive times? I mean, it's just absolutely astounding, but they really don't. So they have a very, the reason they don't, and I'll show data for this, is they have a very classic type 3 mortality function, huge levels of mortality is due to a variety of reasons. And really, one of the interests of our work um, has been to dissect some of these issues going from uh, each one of these transition states to these different um, uh, ontogenetic stages. So if you're going to work someplace for a long period of time, it needs to be a, a system that is quite accessible. We're really very, um, uh, uh, it's very unusual to have a system where you have complete access to all spawning adults. It's a weightable stream about 25 meters in length, average depth about one to two meters. Um, it's a small stream, it's a moderate population size of about 1,200 individuals which reside in Black Lake, and we have a very good estimate of this. This was a paper that we published in Biometry a few years ago, we based on uh, deriving a new closed population estimator. Uh, the spawning uh, locations are known, and over 17 years through the end of last field season, we have over 3,500 captures of 1,147 spawning individuals. So that's what we've tagged. That's our population estimate. Almost every single individual has been tagged, most of them multiple times. They're all tagged with pit tags, passive, and we have passive uh, pit tag arrays when they come into the river and just below the spawning season um, where we work the fish up. Uh, we do our larval drift assessments um, here and we do all sorts of other things. We have temperature loggers. So there's a lot of information that we have coming for these fish. We also have the capability of doing very nice um, research um, in a streamside research facility. So this is the facility on the upper Black River so we can incubate eggs, we can incubate and, and rear uh, larvae of different sizes, we conduct flume experiments, we, can, we have aquatic raceways for various predator prey and other trials, we can hold fish in different tanks um, in different numbers throughout the facility, and so I'll describe some research that we do for that. And importantly, a lot of the field work that we have, if we're trying to estimate reproductive success, you've got to tie the offspring to moms and dads. And we do that because we genotype, and we have genotypes for all the adults in the population, and we genotype about 10% of the offspring across the entire period of larval drift. And so we have an, uh, an, an estimate of reproductive contributions of each adult, when they spawn, where they spawned, who they spawned with, the flow regimes, the temperature regimes uh, for each reproductive event. So I'm just going to start out here with adults. So the adults that we have, we, we, we 
are able to handle almost all of them because we use wetsuits and we send the divers down with, with, with nets. Each fish is, is labeled with an individual specific uh, code of Floyd tags which are colored. Ladies are on the left, males on the right. And this way the divers can visualize and we know where each fish is each time, each day, for as long as the fish is in the river. And then the pit tag arrays tells us when they come and when they go. This is, whoops, this is sort of a typical spawning season. We have a multimodal distribution of spawning, males and females in uh, white and dark respectively. So females and males come in when the water temperature gets to be about 12 degrees, water temperature goes up, discharge varies as a function of flow regimes and rainfall events or snow events. The fish spawn at six known spawning locations and these are the spawning day from day zero to day 40. So you can see that these early spawners, these fish right here, typically spawn downstream and these are the, these are whisker plots showing the means and the confidence intervals so that the early spawners spawn upstream, late spawners spawn downstream, but there's much, much more uh, variation. It's interestingly that when they enter the river and when they enter the spawning areas are entirely predictable. So this is a model, um, uh, uh, autoregressive model. Each one of these points are the number of sturgeon caught on the first, second, third, et cetera day, and I'm just picking three times of, uh, of a 17 year time series, but these are the points, these spline estimates here and the confidence intervals are the model predictions of the number of spawners and what this is is a, a sine cosine function of aluminar illumination. And what we can see here is what we have in these autoregressive models is it's not the temperature and the discharge, but it's a lag effect. 72 hours increasing temperature, 72 hours decreasing discharge, and a lunar function. New moon, excuse me, new moon, full moon, new moon, full moon, new moon, full moon. Very, very predictable, and you can see we have great predictability. So if somebody asked me, okay, one of the fish spawning this year, second new moon after the first of April. And it's within days every year. Another interesting aspect of these things is the inner spawning interval. So we've captured in these individuals enough to know what the inner spawning. And so individuals capped in, captured in time t, this is the probability we'll see them in t plus 1, 2, 3, et cetera. You can see that for females, we never see a female in consecutive years. Only 10% of the time will they spawn every two years, and that's the distribution. So on average, females spawn every 3.7 years. Males, on average, spawn every two years. And it's, that's interesting, but what's really interesting and important is that for the cohorts of fish spawning in year t plus 2, these males and females won't see them each other for another six years because on average females will spawn every three years, males will spawn every two years, and so for populations of really small size for these broadcast spawning species, there's almost no probability of getting full sibs in cohorts in different years except for every six year. So that's kind of an interesting aspect of this life history stage. The other really interesting thing is there's high repeatability in spawning time. So this is for females. These are what we call early, middle, and late spawning. And particularly for the early and somewhat for the late spawning groups, these are the means for those individuals caught two or more times plus the standard error. So with really high predictability, if you get a fish early in the spawning season, there's high repeatability, and you're likely to see that fish on almost the same standardized spawning day every single year. So um, that, that's what they do when they get to the spawning area. The question is, is what is the cues or what are the things that are associated with successfully spawning females? And I'm just going to present just a little bit of data. So this is some information for just one year, and this was part of Carrie Dammerman's dissertation. And again, multimodality of spawning times, temperature, discharge. This year, discharge was pretty variable. So this particular year, the, the adults came in when the temperature was 13 C and the discharge was uh, 17 or 7 uh, meters cubed per second. We had this many adult males and females, so it was almost what well, was a 3 to 1 male to female sex ratio, again, because the males spawn more frequently than females. It's always male bias. This was pretty extreme. Um, and the mean number of males per female when the females were spawning was 7.7. .7. 
And so what we were interested in is estimating reproductive success. So this frequency histogram is the proportion of females which produce zero to five offspring that we captured in our larval drift nets. So again, 10% of the larvae we captured that year, uh, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, okay? So on average, the mean reproductive success of all the females was 10 offspring. But the reproductive success, and this is, uh, was positively associated with increasing temperature, high dis higher discharge, and high mean number, and a sex ratio which was skewed towards males. So here we have abiotic factors um, uh, which affect female reproductive success and biotic factors which dictate which individuals are on which end of the spectrum. So you can take all years, and this is just a uh, AIC table for females and males. These are the AIC values. These are the different models here, and I'm just going to blank out all but just showing you this one. For both males and females, the model of best fit for all years um, for offspring number for both males and females is spawning date, the quadratic effect of spawning date, the body size, quadratic effect of body size, and the zone of the individual. So here's zone, these are for females, um, relative reproductive success for females, there are some zones that they do much better and, and some that they don't. Here's that quadratic effect of body size and here's the quadratic um, uh, effect of standardized spawning date. So most of the, the females of interme um, intermediate size that, that spawn sort of in the intermediate periods uh, or the later first part of the periods and spawn in uh, those spawning zones um, are most successful. It's interesting that males show plasticity, and I mentioned earlier that plasticity we think is going to be really, really important simply because of the changing climatic conditions. So males, as I said, as females um, are more likely to spawn at the same time each year. So again, each of, I'm just taking three years here, and these are the number of males and females in each of these different uh, years. You can see that the sp spawning dates are, are different, but um, there's a, a multimodality in that. And it's really interesting because a large proportion of these males, these early run males, will leave the river and they'll come back to spawn with late spawning females. You know, boys will be boys. There's new girls coming into the river. It's not a bad idea to do that. And so it's, it's a variable number per year. You have smaller number of individuals on, by and large, later in the year. But this is the proportion of offspring sired by those individuals in later time periods. And so when we saw this multimodality and we saw the fact that the re spawning time was repeatable, we thought, we might have reproductive isolation by time, right? There could be some mechanism whereby the early and late spawning groups are really reproductively isolated, but it appears that the males, boys being boys, are the glue reproductively that are bringing the early and late spawning periods together, and there are absolutely no significant differences in allele frequency between early and late spawning groups. So is that an, a, a good strategy? Why aren't all males doing that? Well this is the number of a male's offspring and this is a male resident time. So these guys over here are these guys that are doing this back and forth thing and they realize a significant improvement in their reproductive success. And the question is, well, gee, if that is the case, why aren't all males doing that simply because there appears from an evolutionary perspective to be a benefit for that? And the, and the answer is a couple of things. The males are coming back and why, why isn't it a much, so if they're breeding with N group of females and they're breeding with N times two females now because they're coming back. Why, aren't, why isn't that slope higher? Well, it's not higher because of the sperm quality. Sperm quality, and we, we, we look at sperm count and sperm motility um, uh, in all the males. Each time we catch them, including these guys that come back, male sperm quality increases with body size Male sperm quality increases with interspawning interval. So these males that come back every two or three years rather than every year, they have higher sperm quality. They're fertilizing more individuals. And river residency time. The more time that you're in a river, your sperm quality decreases. So these males may be coming back and they're reaping a benefit, but they ain't packing what they did when they first came in the river the first time, and thus the, the rate of increase is not what it is, and it's basically because they're using most of the sperm during their sp first spawning event. So that's a little bit about adults, then moving on to the next stage, which are free, uh, uh, the egg and the free embryo stage. 
So again, the question, why can't a female that has 11,000 eggs per kilogram replace herself? Well, the answer is that uh, the eggs die, and the eggs die very, very precipitously. These are different experimental controls with different mesh sizes, but the, the answer is the same. After a period of just a couple of days, almost all the eggs are dead. And this is just an example. These are Krieg filters where we went across and we did transects downstream and across the, trans and, and across the stream every meter. And these are Krieg images of the counts of eggs. And so here is one day after um, the, the animal spawned and left. These are the number of eggs um, on the surface. And this is what it looks like two days later. <coughs> Gone. Um, everything. Um, in the river uh, eat sturgeon eggs, and uh, there's a huge loss. So that's the eggs. The larvae, it's really interesting, and um, I don't have a chance to get into this in detail, but have, have people ever heard of the Atkinson effect? The Atkinson effect basically says the body size scales as an inverse function of temperature, rearing temperature, right? So those individuals reared at colder temperature, like individuals from families that were incubated in cold water, like 10 degrees C at the beginning of the season. These are the means and the confidence intervals of body size at hatch, total length, for offspring from early and middle and late spawning females. And this is the same thing in eggs that we've hatched in the hatchery that were deposited in the field from early, middle, and late spawn. So there's a huge, I mean, I mean seriously huge difference in body size um, in um, eggs reared in different temperatures. There's also a very strong genetic effect because obviously these different females, these are different families. There's a high heritability, about 23% of the variance in body size, and I'll get back to this in a minute, um, at hatch is due to that. So very strong environmental effect, and to the extent that size is a predictor of survivorship, and we'll come back to this, and size has an environmental temperature component as well as a genetic component, then this becomes really important. So we've done a lot of studies <coughs> where we've done some experiments, and I'm just going to go through, again, some of the power of, okay, you have some ideas and taking them out for a test drive. And so in this particular one, we were interested in, in female selectivity of microgeographic um, variability in, uh, in, uh, in, in habitats. So the objective were to determine if larval traits vary as a function of microhabitat conditions at the point where females deposited the eggs. So what we did was we went to one of the spawning areas and we sampled eggs every five, transects every five meters downstream and every meter across there. So these were um, a transect and the idea was to use the accumulative critical thermal units to predict, and we know what it is. So Lake Sturgeon, they need about 70 CTUs to hatch, 65 to 70 CTUs to hatch. So we let them experience the conditions where the eggs were deposited for as long as possible, right before the individuals were to, were to uh, uh, be captured. So they were experiencing the microenvironment at that place. And then we took this long-handled metal rod that we grouted um, stadia rod readings in there so we could get depth. We took a photograph so we could get um, rock size. Um, we took uh, flow rates with a Marsh McBurney. So we had depth, we had flow, we had um, uh, microhabitat in terms of uh, mean and the variation in size. And we collected all the eggs which were just before um, hatch. And this is what the distribution was. So these are the number of eggs at each of the spots through the different transects that we have. So there were some hot spots and some low spots. But we had eggs from quite a few different places. And we had quite a few different variable measurements to measure habitat. So what we did then is out of 274 fish, that um, uh, eggs that we had, um, uh, we could assign parentage. And there were 40 females and 61 males. And these are the reproductive successes of the own individuals. And mo the majority of the samples were contributed by 70, or excuse me, seven of the females. And so this is a picture of what um, a, a variation in the body size after a couple of weeks. And so what we did is we measured them. And after we measured them at hatch, we measured body area, body length, and yolk sac area. Then we put them in half-gallon jugs, and the jugs were put in these um, uh, flow regimes, these, these uh, uh, raceways, with water going into each one, so, and they were checked 
um, uh, for a period of several different weeks. So they were photographed so we could get these length measurements right at hatch, uh, then at these different time periods. They were fed when they emerged from the substrate, um, uh, and a fit was collected for parentage analysis. So we were interested in using a generalized mixed model, using an animal model where we had a matrix of the genetic relationship between each individual. So an individual has a gene correlation or is related to itself, right, one, uh, to a full sib, one half, to a half sib, 0.25. So there's an n by n matrix, 274 by 274. It's called the A matrix where we had, and that's where the animal comes in. And so for traits at hatch, this is the model. We had discharge temperature. These are the measurements that we took in the stream, right? So this is that environmental component. This is the genetic component. And then for the body measurements at each of the different time periods, here we actually had to use a random regression model to account for multiple sampling in each of these different time periods. But again, we have our, um, uh, uh, um, a model with uh, uh, age. Um, here the, the environment was controlled, right? So it's just age uh, and the animal components. So the best model that predicted the size at hatch was a model that had no genetic effects but it was significantly predicted by discharge, higher discharge, higher body size, greater depth, lower body size, and mean, greater, um, lower mean substrate size, lower, lower body size. Um, uh, and so the variability in body size at, at the hatch stage was entirely um, environmentally determined. There was no genetic effect. This is the changes in body size from when they were put into those jugs, when they emerged from the gravel, and these are the body size here. And this is, a, again, a representation of the differences in body size. There was a huge differences in growth regime in some situations. Those of the largest were the, were the, lar were, were the smallest later on. And interestingly, what we saw is an increase in the relative contributions of genetic versus environmental variance. So this is a measure of variance estimates. Um, additive genetic variance or family effects increases um, over time at each of the time periods measures. And here's our estimates of narrow sense heritability. So they went from zero or unestimable in, in the hatch larvae to 45 to 65%, so a heritability of 0.65 means 65% of the variance in body size were due to differences in family. So really a considerable difference in terms of size at hatch, the variables which were really underlying size at hatch and those that were underlying um, body size um, about at the time that, um, they're, they're well, well past the time that they're downstream. And so the conclusions of this were that these female selected micro Habitat characteristics were really, really um, important earlier on, but the, um, uh, the, uh, the genetic characteristics or the aspects of family or who the female spawned with and her, her own genetic background were really important. <coughs> that study really spawned some interest because, again, we were interested in cues and we were interested in temperature and discharge. And so this is more work from Carrie Dammerman what she was interested in looking at were experiments. So this was in the stream. Can we, can, we, can we manipulate that, right? So instead of just recording what the fish was selecting in terms of discharge and temperature, or discharge and depth and substrate, why don't we manipulate things like temperature or flow regime? And we can use, again, the genotype as a family, but we would expose those individuals to different environments. And here we're looking for, again, an environmental or a genetic component, but we're also looking for a genetic by environment interaction, right? And this is this example. So a gene by E or a genetic by environment interaction is different genotypes, A1 or A2, and this, the relative trait size varies as a function of the environment that that genotype is exposed to, right? So that's what we were interested in doing with these experiments. And here we were, we were rearing things in, these are the incubators, these are Kmart heath trays, um, <laughs> pencil holders but that we turned into heath trays, but they work very well. <clears throat> so we, we, we manipulated temperature regimes here with the heaters and chillers. We manipulated discharges in here um, based on, on, these, uh, on these flumes where we put the eggs from the females um, on the flumes there. So, these are the larval experiments. And so for velocity, we put replicates of each eggs of each female 
and incubated them under low velocity, high velocity, and an intermediate velocity where we, every 12 hours, uh, mimicking a peaking dam operation, we put it high and low. Okay, so we, those were the three treatment regimes. For the temperature regimes, we were incubating the eggs at different temperatures. So this is a, a high temperature, constant temperature, a low temperature, a, a very, this is, the green is ambient temperature. This is just the diol variation, which is, because we're getting the water right from the river, right? And then this was an experimentally manipulated where the amplitude of the diol variation was approximately two to four times what we were experiencing um, in nature. So again, we were measuring uh, body size at hatch, body size at emergence, so we had, but here we put each individual in a beer cup, very classic experimental design with, with, with 16 ounce beer cups. Um, uh, yeah, and so we were measuring uh, body length and body size. So these are the models for the velocity experiment. We were using a generalized linear mixed model um, using package um, LME um, in, uh, in our package. Here we were using a Bayesian estimator um, just because of some of the idiosyncratic details of the experimental design. But the important thing is this, so here is the results. And so each one of these lines and the different symbols represents a family. And this is the body size or the mean body size of the warm, variable, ambient, and cold, okay? So this is incubation temperature. This is discharge. And here we have low velocity, variable velocity, and high velocity. And what I've circled here are the families and the phenotypes at an important time period. And the point that I want to mention here is there's a significant, obviously, G by E interaction here, right? The genotypes have different phenotypes at different velocities and different temperatures. But think about this in terms of the variation. So here under cold regimes, very little variation. Here under the high temperature regimes, you have huge variation. Here under high discharge regimes, huge variation. And again, to the extent that that body size is really important to predation pressure, what you have is a situation where you have these e conditions of extreme environmental deviance, i.e. conditions that we're increasingly seeing due to climate change, due to temperature, and due to discharge conditions, we're seeing more extreme variation, but that variance is reflected at the level of family, okay? So what that means is that if there are individuals that are large and there are individuals that are size, there are families of individual larger in sizes. And to the extent that those smaller individuals may be exposed to predation to a greater degree, you can predict, potentially, due to predation or other things associated with body size, who the winners and losers might be. And so we're losing individuals, but we're used, losing individuals non-randomly. It's a function of family, and it's decreasing levels of genetic variation within the populations. So moving on to the last stage here. So we, so I showed you pictures of we're losing huge numbers of, of eggs. We have huge effects in terms of phenotype and the potentially for loss of individuals of different body sizes. But one year, a couple of really industrious graduate students, uh, former graduate students, Jamie Crossman and um, Patrick Forsyth said, well, instead of just doing larval drift at where we normally do, why don't we do it at three places? with the same number of people. And so they put five D-frame drift nets right below the spawning area, which was right here, um, where we normally do, two kilometers down and four kilometers down. And what this represents are the number of larvae that were sampled at the upstream, downstream, and way downstream sample at each hour. So we put the nets in at 9 o'clock. We check them at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock, five times in a row, all, all nets. And we totally enumerate all the benthic drift in here. And what we saw was that this upstream site here in the red, you start seeing you know, a few, and you start seeing them at 9 o'clock, but you don't see anything further downstream. And then a lot, and then fewer and fewer. The next hour, you didn't see anything here, but two kilometers is about how far an individual can drift passively in the water column. And so they're coming from the spawning areas. They're not short stopping anywhere. And you see the same thing, right? And we've done some studies, this is a, another PhD student, that showed over this time period in a different year, there was about 25% mortality. So we had gear efficiency, so we were able to just numerically estimate the changes in relative abundance at each of these time periods. The most telling is this, 
So if you get things starting down here and you get this many and then you get fewer, then you get down here and first of all, you hardly ever see them at all until three hours later and they're just relatively dozens there. So where are they going? And you see this night after night. They come up, they drift, they get eaten. They get up, they drift, they get eaten. And so that was really interesting. So after we did that, we started saying, well, we've got to really move into more of a community ecology predator-prey study, and that's what we started doing. So there are a lot more things out there drifting that are co-distributed prey than sturgeon, and they include, so this is sturgeon, so these are hundreds. And again, you have early offspring from early spawners, and again, we know that because we genotype a subset of them, and these are from late spawners. But interestingly, we saw peaks in catastomids. So there are other fish larvae that are out there, and that's about all that's out there. There um, is catastomids. And then there are all these larvae um, uh, of, of macroinvertebrates. And it's really interesting that those suckers ain't the same suckers. They're different species. And so the co-distributed prey, and just think of the dynamics of catastomids. Some years you may have more white sucker larvae produced. Some years you may have more red horse. So these early and late larvae, there are differences in body size. They come from different individuals by and large, except for the males that kind of do this plastic swapping thing. Um, and th they are subjected to different potential predator pressures because you have different co-distributed species which are many times higher abundance than them. And further, you have almost, not complete, but huge differences in the fa familial composition of the different macroinvertebrates over time. So it's a very complex situation. And so we decided that we really needed to do some diet analysis on this. But we, we, we made a really kind of significant twist to this. And so we did a diet analysis and um, so the, every fish has a different physiology and different anatomy, right? So some fish like centrarchids have very big guts, um, some have almost no guts, some like sturgeon have spiral valves, um, very, very different anatomy. And, but there's really important, and this is a paper that just came out, the, the really importance of standardizing um, uh, the prey condition. And it's really very hard for you to use what typically people do. So typically they stick something down the stomach and they use gastric lavage and they evacuate <coughs> the front part, the stomach. Um, and then they, they either can morphologically identify things um, or they use spines, they use clythra, stuff. Um, but if, if, you're, if, if your fish are larvae and they're drifting at night and you can't get out till the next morning, there isn't a full fish, there aren't clythra, there aren't spines, there aren't whole bodies. So there are, there's that. It's just goop, right? And so what we've been doing is, and I'm going to present here with another couple of examples, is we've been doing a molecular diet analysis. So we basically take and anesthetize or euthanize the fish. We take the entire lower GI tract sample. Um, we put it in there. We mix it up. We use DNA methods, and we estimate the proportional contribution of the species using molecular methods. So there are two ways of doing that. So most of you have probably heard of barcoding, right? So like for carp, right? They use presence absence based on the presence absence of a PCR product. And so one of the things that, and this is work from Justin Waraniak and actually um, uh, Danny Bloomstein, who is a graduate student here now, uh, is a co-author on one of these papers, but it was Justin's master's thesis, um, wanted to do you know, spe species specific. So presence absence, sturgeon DNA there, sturgeon DNA not. And this is really pretty easy and it's relatively inexpensive. The other one was, I want to estimate the diets. I want to know anything that's in the gut, particularly those things that are in the larval drift, right? The catastomids, the sturgeon, and these insect families. And there we were using DNA metabarcoding and next generation sequencing. So the first thing was, what's in here? Is there a sturgeon in there or not? Um, and so we developed, um, or Danny and Justin developed, the sturgeon-specific assays. And what they did is every night for a series of nights, so 17 nights over two years, they would set these deframed drift nets above and below a, a half kilometer area. So a half kilometer stream. Larvae would go through, some larvae would get caught in the net. We have an idea of net efficiency. Some would get caught in the stomachs and everything else would pass out. And so 
We had five hourly collections. We measured discharge at the nets. We measured the number. And importantly, we had biomass estimates. So every family of invertebrates, every catastoma, and for sturgeon, it's important because we were able to take the total number of things to total biomass in terms of grams of prey item that were out migrating each night. Um, <coughs> and that was important. So, but here what we had is we had stuff invertebrates and fish, so we had availability, right? So we had what was available in the diet that night in that one half kilometer stretch of river. So we had prey availability. The next day we would go out and we would electroshock that entire half kilometer area. We would take up to 10 individuals per each of the fish species. They would be euthanized. We'd take their stomach content samples. We would put them in jars and which came up with a total of 1140 samples uh, from 27 uh, different fish predator species. And so this barcoding, this presence absence, is what do you do? So you have species of one thing, say a sturgeon. So you extract the DNA, you design primer sequences, and so the primer sequences are really important. So if you design a primer where the sequences of the species, sturgeon DNA or, or other fish species of DNA doesn't match, it won't amplify. So the only thing that you get an amplification product is if you use a sturgeon specific primer and that matches exactly to the sturgeon. And we verified for all the fish species in the river, the only thing that amplified was sturgeon. So we actually had that as a test. So what you see over all these samples is either a positive or a negative based on the presence or absence of these PCR products. So it's a very simple, easy test, very easy to do. The other thing with the metabar coating is you can design primers in there instead of species specific primers, what you're designing with primers is that are universal. So they're amplifying DNA of everything, all the bugs, all the fish, including catastomids. And what you're relying on is a database where you have the sequences in the middle of here, which are species specific. Okay? So it's, 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 a, it's a general barcoding primer, um, uh, and that's what we were using. So basically, you start out here with DNAs of everything. You develop a database of sequences for your species. You go through a pipeline, and basically what you're coming up with is for each one of your fish uh, gut samples, the number of sequences from each taxa. And the idea here, and what Justin validated, and I won't show you the data, is he created made-up communities, is that the relative number of sequences is a good estimator, highly correlated with biomass, the biomass of each predator or prey species in the gut. So what you have is a molecular means of quantifying the entire diet, and then by using the relative number of sequences of each individual diet taxa, that's a good surrogate estimate of relative proportion. So you had availability in the stream, we have what's eaten. So what he was interested in doing is, uh, first of all, with this presence absence, is is there a sturgeon absent or present in the gut binomial regression as a function of the predator species and the predator size, as a proportion of the biomass of the drift made up the night before, as a function of the biomass of the drift of the catastomids. Maybe there's differences in substrate, because we had two sand and two gravel substrate half kilometer transects. Maybe it's lunar illumination. Maybe, it, maybe it, you know, the, these fish, which are largely visual predators, are able to get sturgeon and anything else under nights where there are a full moon um, or no cloud cover. And then we had a temporal autocorrelation component. So it's a binomial regression. And this is what we found. So we have probability of sturgeon consumed as a function of the biomass of these predator, prey types. So as you might guess, as the proportion of, um, or, or the biomass, the total biomass of sturgeon increases, the probability of finding sturgeon in the stomach increases. So these are the point estimates and the shaded areas associated with each color are their 95% confidence intervals. Sturgeon, proportion of sturgeon, probability of sturgeon consumed decreases as a function of increasing invertebrates in the diet. So more bugs, more alternate prey, um, less probability of, of sturgeon being in the diet. Very little estimate based on total biomass of catastomids. However, when the proportion, you look at the proportion of the entire biomass for that night, that's catastomids, you have a significant decrease. So not necessarily the biomass per se, but the proportion of the nightly biomass, proportion made up of catastomids was important. 
And you ask the question, is lunar illumination important? Yes, the probability of a sturgeon consumed was significantly associated with the percent illumination. So new moon, full moon. It was also associated with substrate. So there's a small effect on substrate. They were more vulnerable, slightly higher probability in sand, and a lower probability with higher discharge. So that was that. So we move on to the diet analysis. And so here um, we have uh, biomass of, well, let's, let's just see, Look, catastomans. So an individual catastoman on average weighs 1.19 milligrams. And for each of the nights, and we did this for seven nights, um, uh, this is the total biomass in grams that we estimate was composed of catastomans. Here's sturgeon, an average sturgeon dry weight biomass, 8.5 grams, milligrams, and these were the number of grams. So there's considerable variation here. Look at, look at here, I mean, <laughs> there's one pretty significant night with a heck of a lot of catastomids. And here was just one. This is uh, a heptanegeid, uh, which is a species or a family of mayflies, and here are uh, 1.7 milligrams, and also um, less variability, but uh, still some variability here. So what proportion of the diet? So here are our predator species. These are the prey items that we were interested in here, and just look at this. So here's smallmouth bass. For smallmouth bass, 14% of the sequences were catastomids. Is that right? Yeah. 1% 1 uh, 1 were sturgeon, and 19% were heptanegeids. And I should say that these are based on a, 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 a rarefied uh, 20, 2,000 sequences per sample. So 2,000 sequences, 19% of them were heptanegeids. So that's smallmouth bass. Here's pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed, at least the ones that we sampled, didn't eat sturgeon, didn't eat heptanegeids, and they ate that many catastomids. So what's eating sturgeon? Ask the parent. So here's what's eating sturgeon. There are some species that didn't, some species that did. The ones that did, log perch, uh, yellow perch, horny head chub. So perkids like them. Um, and they, they're, they, they were actually, uh, I'm not going to show preference data, but they per actually preferred them. So what you can do is you can take the diet data and you can do principal coordinate analysis. And so each one of the different colors represents each one of the different predator species. And each dot represents a location in principal one, principal coordinate space. So these are the eigenvalues associated with the different, um, uh, the different individual prey items. What these ellipses are, 95% confidence interval ellipses, the colors uh, likewise associated with each predator. So, the distribution of the points along this line on the uh, PC2 coordinate are associated with increases and decreases in heptanegeid mayflies. Here, increases in heptanegeid mayflies or increases in rotifers. If you take a look at the organization of where these, where these blue-looking things and the orange-looking things here, these are cyprinids and these are perkids, and these are centrarchids. That, that's diet, including everything, including sturgeon. You could ask the question, are there differences by day? And the answer is yes. And these are, or excuse me, uh, early versus late in the time period. And the answer is yes. And again, we, here we have samoids or black fly um, uh, larvae. And again, along this axis, rotifers and heptanegeids. So the answer is life is complicated, right? <laughs> so, um, but importantly, and one of those other slides showed that we sampled one sturgeon in 1140 GI tracts of predators that you could identify as a sturgeon. 7% of the fish in the stream had sturgeon in the stomachs. And you think about how many predator fish, how many fish do you have in your rivers that have sturgeon in them? And think about 7% of those fish potentially having consumed a sturgeon on any given night. It's kind of, I think, goes a long ways into explaining where we're at. So anyway, um, life is complicated, and I've taken you through life, at least through a few stages of life, um, to show a little bit about the biology of the animal. Again, I hope the impression about what you can do with the power of genetics. And I'm really very excited, and we're really moving forward with this metabar coding 
in terms of eDNA and aquatic community uh, uh, characterization across all trophic levels using water samples and eDNA to metabarcoding to the diet samples. We're doing metabarcoding to enumerate larval sturgeon diets, which has been kind of interesting so far. You cannot look at <laughs> larval fish diets using I, I have not done it, but I don't think you can using standard techniques. So anyway, a long period of time, Ed Baker of the Michigan DNR is the co-PI on all these projects. Uh, uh, Terry Marsh, Nancy Auer, Darren uh, Simpkins, uh, a lot of funding sources over 18 years. Um, if you're interested in any of this, we have a Great Lakes Lake Sturgeon website that you're certainly welcome to tune into. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. The Michigan State University vesicle, Vessel uh, Research Program. Did you um, see any differences in the size of eggs with the size or age of the females? Yeah, egg size is definitely correlated with body size, yeah. Not strongly, but yeah, I mean. Well, I mean, it may be a factor if um, the body size of females was genetically determined, and it might be, but I mean, the differences in female body size, I mean, we're dealing with a six and a half foot fish and a three foot fish. I mean, it's age related, right? So a huge component of that is age. And so you're, I mean, we haven't really looked at uh, egg size variation as a, as a heritable trait. And it's really hard to do that because it's provisioning, right? There's so much of a maternal effect. So you could do it. You could estimate the, the family contribution, but it wouldn't be a, a strictly additive or a genetic component because there's dominant variants in there. Uh, there. There's maternal effects, right? It's the maternal condition, maternal age, right? All that stuff. So it would be kind of difficult to do without, a, without giving some thought to the experiment. But uh, I guess it... It says it depends. <laughs> what are some of the traits and characteristics of this particular system that, uh, that, that is such that the surgeon can actually be developed in others that entirely still exist? Uh, they almost didn't. Well, <clears throat> the population was. Um, uh, the, they had a population estimate of sorts uh, in the 1970s. Um, they did an estimate in the 19, uh, early 1990s, and they estimate that the population decreased by about uh, seven or eight-fold. And it was unlimited fishing, uh, spear fishing. And so what they did is they, um, they, they uh, adopted rather rigorous, um, very rigorous, um, uh, limits. So right now, they're li and we have, a, again, a very good handle on the population, so we've developed these open population estimators based on our map capture rec mark recapture data. So we have very precise estimates of the population size, so they're only harvesting 1.2% of the population per year, which is 14 fish. Very strict allocations. Um, hard to do on a 4,000 hectare body of water that's frozen over, but they do it with snowmobiles and horns, and I mean, it's kind of a circus. The season lasts, unlike Lake Winnebago here, about 45 minutes to an hour and a half each year. But, but, but to answer your question, yes, I mean, they were highly exploited, overly so. Um, we, in addition to doing our work, also have a contract with the Michigan DNR to use a lot of the larvae for the larval drift. Um, and we stock 500 fish a year into Black Lake, as a, and we have been for eight, about 16 out of the 18 years. And so there's been a supplementation program, but we're using a, a, a large component of the diversity because we've done some studies that basically show that if you use larval drift, you're, you're sampling almost the entire adult, almost all the adults that year are contributing at least some larvae rather than just taking gametes. It's really very hard to do direct gamete takes with, you know, you can only get a, you know, maybe a, a dozen or a few more individuals. So we're contributing a lot of diversity, but unfortunately because of the, the conditions here in terms of the huge levels of mortality from the egg to the free embryo to the larval stage, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, they're going to be in the stocking business, I think, for a while until they could figure it out. I mean, we posed this question, to, and I, I think f for those that work with managers, 
you know, from our perspective, you do two things. You cut down the predation or you increase the prey. And you're not likely able to rote on a stream to get rid of the fish predators and, you know, change fish communities. But you can change habitat to improve conditions for invertebrates. And so that therein lies this anthropogenic effect. I mean, we're in a, um, a state, a state, not a preserve, but I mean, it's, you know, it's not pristine, but it's not that bad for that area of Michigan, but there's still issues, right? There are dams and stuff, um, a lot of runoff, a lot of sedimentation. But I mean, if you can do management to increase the prey base. So for instance, for, in many adfluvial species in the Great Lakes, you've seen a huge plummet, right, in sucker numbers. A lot of adfluvial species that are coming in that are alternate prey or that are reproducing, walleye. Well, they're in earlier, but suckers, in, for sure, we've seen a huge decline in suckers. And suckers were positively correlated with um, probability of lake sturgeon in the diet. So I think doing things to increase the diversity and the relative abundance of alternate prey, habitat modification, things that you can do to maximize, particularly some of these invertebrates. So I was highlighting heptanegeids. These fish like heptanegeids. They're really big and juicy and so, I mean, but yeah, I mean, so I, I think that's what you can do. I think it's stream improvement, <laughs> uh, not to put more predators in there, but for the predators that are there in situations where you're trying to maximize recruitment of these larval fishes, you put other groceries in there so that you, they're not picking on the sturgeon or whatever you're interested in protecting. Have you been able to determine or measure the effects of non-point pollution, or you're dealing with environments that are pretty clean, in other words, versus, I'll give you an example, this is Indianapolis some time ago, all of a sudden a whole bunch of dead fish in the White River upstream was an illegal dumping of, from a cheese factory. Oh, right. I'm curious if we're able to, what I'm trying to get at is the tolerance of a given species, in this case sturgeon, to a certain level of pollutants. To pollutants. Um, you know, there have been contaminant studies um, with sturgeon. I know TFM kills the hell out of them. So if you're a lamprey uh, control fan, that's not really necessarily really great news. But, um, um, but yeah, I mean, th there have been studies on contaminants. I'm really not sure of a lot of that, uh, it's not a, recent, not, not a literature that I'm really uh, very uh, aware of. I would say though, in our system, um, the, the biggest problem is sedimentation. I mean, there's bad sedimentation load. I mean, there's some agriculture, you know, really small farming along the edges of the river, but um, it's really not that bad. There's no industry along, excuse me, the entire watershed. Um, so it's the hydroelectric operations, and the hydroelectric operations are, are responsible for a lot of the increasing amplitude and of, of discharge. Um, not, they're, they're supposed to be running run of the river, but I'm just talking about diol variation uh, due to water that they have to pass. So the, the, the peak of the release is higher, and the length of time before the water is cleared is longer in a dam versus a non-dam situation. And the other thing is, is water temperature. I mean, the reason why we have these fish coming in in, in, in the last half a decade and spawning at just crazy times are, is if you get really warm water, what you do is you get ice out on these really shallow reservoirs upstream, which means that the solar heat in days where you can have 70s and 80s, and then it might be freezing again, but that warm water in those ponded small reservoirs, at least in our system, goes downstream and it enters a cold lake. And regardless of what the lake temperature is, those fish are staging at the spawning, at the, at, at the mouths of the rivers, and they're perceiving you know, days in a row, like our predictive equation, where the water temperature is consistently high, and they come up. And the, 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 the example that I gave about Blizzards is exactly what happens. There is one year where the, or a couple of years where the fish did that, and a quarter of the fish, all the eggs died. I mean, you get water temperature that decreases eight degrees C and ain't, doesn't do good things for fish eggs. And that's, that's, a, that's the trap, right? That's the, that's the trap. A fish says, oh, it's warm. And it's warm because the reservoirs were ponded and the ice got off early that year, and the water warmed. They come up and they spawn. Everything's fine. They leave and you get two feet of snow still mid-April, and we know that they didn't spawn because, again, we did 
the genotyping and we were looking and we were looking and we never saw anything and we genotyped and we never saw anything. I think there was one larvae that was produced from 25% of the earlier spawners that year. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, and there's a, a, a reception outside. Can we give Kim uh, one more round of applause?